Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your Word. The Bible says that the entrance of your Word brings light, and it gives us understanding to the simple. We thank you, we honor you this afternoon, that you are about to shape destinies today. By reason of the glory of God, we thank you, God, that you have availed us this time an opportunity to come and share our mind and uh, fellowship with your Holy Spirit the teachers. Um, in Jesus' mighty name, we've prayed and believed. The topic that I've given was majorly around the place of, of uh, career, business, and what? Money making. Makaranda <laughs> rasta kayashi. Somebody speak in tongues. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, um, let's open our Bibles to the book of Proverbs 13, verse 22. If you're there, you say amen. I'm going to take another perspective, but bear with me because this is what the Lord has been putting on my spirit to share. But I'm going to take a very, you know, I know, I know, um, okay, let me begin this way. Every time we want to talk about, you know, making money, career development, success, in business and all these kinds of things, it's painfully for me. Every time we invite some people who are Christian, eh? some people share the world, the, the wisdom of the world. You get where I'm coming from. And the Bible says that the wisdom of this world is going to be brought to nothing. You understand? For example, um, some of the principles that people share eh, in the world all these things carry a biblical foundation. You get my point. Although sometimes we throw away the word and then people just resolve to using um, worldly ideas and they get to a point where they are frustrated because they have subjected themselves to the spirit of this world. Hallelujah. I want to submit to you that this world has a spirit. And the Bible says, you did not receive the spirit which is of this world. Let me tell you something about the world of this, the spirit of this world. The spirit of this world is competition. Are you hearing? The spirit of this world is not having enough. And you're never going to have enough. The spirit of this world is comparison. That means you're going to always be compared with another man. You'll sit on your work desk. But you'll have a problem with the guy who you're seated next to. Not because they are wrong or bad, but because you will feel a certain way when they're advancing in a certain form. And because the spirit of this world is a spirit of competition, even Christians have gone into that nonsense. They work with a competitive spirit. You understand? They are motivated under the spirit of competition, but not under the spirit of purpose. They are pushed to compete with fellow people. That's why he, some Christians even speak evil about fellow Christians in businesses. Some people um, go behind uh, their fellow friends and cut ungodly deals just to cut out one person. Some people, um, they, 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 they mud slain others. Eh? They speak evil. They blackmail other people. Why? Because they need to get through. Because it is the spirit of this world. You get my point? Some people even employ principles of this world even as principles of the spirit. And then we get those guys and they have earned wealth by blood. The Bible tells us not to earn wealth by blood. They have earned wealth by unjust weight. The Bible refuses us to earn wealth under unjust weight. That means the things that people do to cut corners to make profit and become rich. For example, um, some people cheat taxes. 
You understand? Some people um, pack wrong things. You get my point? Some people make a few fraud things in the back end. But then they become rich. But then they also carry the brand Christian. And when they do, eh, we now start to celebrate them. Come and teach us how to make money. But the spirit under which the man made money was innocent blood. It was unjust weight. You get my point? It wasn't out of diligence. You get my point? Like, for example, when the Bible says that he that sleepeth in the harvest, there are people who sleep in the harvest. Then they float principles and then probably do one or wrong, two or three, three things, which are wrong. Eh? But somehow they make the end of money. You understand? But because they still carry the brand Christian, we also say, ah, ah this one should what? Come and tell us how he makes money. So at the end of the day, even our inspiration is not based against truth. It is based against what we see. You get my point? So there's a huge problem there. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If we have to have another generation that is going to experience the power and the word of God and the, 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 the life of God in the prosperity, which really is of God, we must teach it the God way. Hallelujah. So if you even want to title this meeting today, title it, Doing Business God's Way or Making Wealth God's Way. You understand? In other words, that there is another way you can make it and it still what? Counts, okay? There are guys who have sacrificed children, you know that, and um, kill people just because they need to make wealth. And some of those people also bear the name Christian, and they are also teaching young people how to do business. But in the back end, the guy knows that everything I'm telling them is something anybody else can tell them. The back end of it is honestly, I shed innocent blood. You get where I'm coming from? Now, when you're spiritual, you must understand that those are not rumors. Eh? And you can't say, I don't believe that you know, someone can kill somebody and then make wealth. Please don't be funny. Listen, those guys are under a different covenant. You get where I'm coming from? Those guys are under a different covenant. You see, let me open my, your eyes to something here. Everything spiritual, if it requires a manifestation physical, it needs a sacrifice. You get it? That's why the book of Hebrews says <laughs> that there are things in the spirit realm, for example, the, the tabernacle, okay? It spoke of the things which were invisible becoming visible and said that the tabernacle required a form of sacrifice for it to be manifested in the earth. The Bible tells us that when he was instructing Moses, he told him that make sure that you build the temple according to the pattern which I have shown you at the mount. Meaning that everything we do earthly already has a spiritual bearing. Say amen. So when he says that, make sure that you build the temple according to the pattern which I have laid up for you at the mountain. It means that God came to Moses, gave him a spiritual vision of how the temple was supposed to be. This guy sees it and then gets a hold of it in his spirit. So, in his soul. And then God tells him, make sure you build it exactly the way you received it. And that is why the scriptures again say in the Bible that all these earthly things have heavenly copies. Whether it's a ministry, it has a heavenly copy. Whether it's a business, it has a heavenly copy. Whether it's a marriage, it has a heavenly copy. Whatever you see physically has a spiritual representation of it. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews 11, I think, one, uh, 3, it says, By faith we understand that the worlds were created by the word of God, that the things that are seen, the Bible says we're not brought about by the things which do appear. Do you realize? Things seen, things which don't appear. Okay? In other words, that everything that you see in appearance has a bearing of things that don't appear. Okay? That means everything spiritual determines how we manifest everything physical. And sometimes, ultimately, it is the maturity to know how to work with the spiritual world to see that what you see in the spirit starts to manifest in the physical. When it starts to manifest in the physical, um, you realize that you start to work on a certain line of purpose. More than just um, working because you need to work, doing business because you need to do business, having a profession because you need to do a profession, uh, doing all these kinds of things because you need to do those kinds of things. Hallelujah. 
Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we together? So, if the Bible has said that the, if there was a requirement of a certain sacrifice in Hebrews, eh? I want to show you how the guys in the world probably, how they do it. Hebrews 9.23. He says, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of the what? Of the things in heaven eh? should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than this. You, I, am I reading something here? Am I reading something there? So what does Hebrews 9.23 say? Read. Hebrews 9.23. What does it say? It was therefore necessary that the pattern of the things... Are you, you read this. The pattern of the things in heaven uh -huh, should be purified with these. What was he talking about? The sacrifices. Okay? Uh-huh. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than this. He was talking about the difference between the heavenly things and the earthly things. Okay? And he said that the things of the earth could have been dealt with no more sacrifices. Yeah? Hebrews 9.23. But the things of the heavenly, the Bible says they required better sacrifices than this. Meaning... That if they, when there was a necessity to manifest the things of the heavenlies on the earth, there was a necessity of sacrifice. Are you with me? And Jesus becomes the ultimate sacrifice for the Christian. The men of those worlds, are you hearing me, also work with the spiritual world. And that spiritual world is demonic. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That is why the guys who do witchcraft in the other world, they are told, Sacrifice your son. Because the devil wants to work with the same principle of getting the things invisible and manifesting those very things physical. Are you with me? So that's why people sacrifice people. Or we, we need a blood, you know? We need a shedding of blood. But the reason why people are doing all that is because they need to manifest something spiritual to a physical perspective. Knowing this, that everything, that's why the Bible says, everything that has a physical bearing has a spiritual copy. If you do business and it doesn't have a heavenly copy, or if you're doing a career and there is no heavenly copy, you understand? If you're doing whatever you're doing and it doesn't have a heavenly copy, then you're bound. As surely as day is, it doesn't matter how smart you are, how effective you are, how hardworking you are, you will fail. Because everybody is a success by a higher power. Either somebody will use a devil or somebody will use God. There is no middle ground of somebody who is just successful. People are not just made. Are you hearing me? People are not just what? Praise the Lord. So, uh, that's why I'm trying to say that um, these days are very careful when we start to say um, we need to invite people or we need to share about uh, how to be wealthy, how to make careers run and how to make money. We need a spiritual perspective to eat. Not a guy who has shed innocent blood not a guy who has unjust weight, you understand? Because a guy will come in, import business, okay? And then get to a certain guy through a certain agent and work with a certain guy in URA. And they're going to float principles. The guy is not going to pay full amounts of URA. And then after that, he's going to make off a little line of profit. And there are other people who are going to do the same business and they're going to pay the whole amount of URA. And at the end of the day, they're going to earn less. And we're going to look for this guy who earned more than them. And we're going to say, let this guy come and teach us about how to make money. So you also go into the same business, but you have to do the right principle of URA. And before you know it, it's not working out the way you expected it. You understand? But it worked for some guy. You get where I'm coming from? And then more questions come up. So we require that we do this the God way. That's why the title is Making Wealth the God's Way. The godly, the, no, Making Wealth God's Way. So Proverbs 13.22, what does it say? I need us to see a certain perspective. Very, very important. If you're there, somebody, if you're there, you just read for me. 13.22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Somebody read it again. An inheritance to his what? Children's children. That's a good man. And the wealth of is there for the just. Hallelujah. That is where I want to take my sharing from. 
when the Bible says that a good man, a good man stores up or lays up an inheritance for his children and his children's children, it means that now I want you to go past the thought that you need a job, past the thought that you're going to do business, past the thought that you're going to build an empire, past the thought that you're looking for a job to a place where now I want us to define the wealth that you're going to enjoy, that your sons are going to enjoy, that your sons' sons are going to enjoy. Somebody say amen. If you are not building on the principle of something my children will have and my children's children, then we are not going to do business or create wealth the godly way. You and I know that the scriptures are clear, that he is the God that gives us power to what? To make wealth. That he might establish the covenant that he made with our forefathers. Meaning that sometimes, in fact all the time, the wealth that we are attracting as Christians is promises he made to Abraham. That I shall bless your seed. You look and think about it. He said, I shall what? Bless your seed. I shall multiply them. They shall be great among the nations. He promised him. And therefore, everybody who comes into the closet, sorry, the, 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 the covering of Abraham, there is a certain anointing that comes upon you that has to attract, that has to do certain things simply because God gives you the anointing to make wealth that he might establish the covenant that he made with your forefathers. Consequently, there are things that the Lord is promising you and you're going to be a forefather to your own son and daughter. That your children are going to be a success in this world because God promised something to you. Are you hearing me? Or because you related with a God with whom you carried a certain promise with. The sadness that we carry in Africa is that we were not inspired to function under the spirit of greatness. Greatness is a spirit. You understand? Greatness is not an attitude. Nobody wakes up with an, with an attitude to be great. Everybody who moves with greatness carries greatness as a seed. And that seed is entirely built in the man that the Lord, or in the man that the Lord established before us. For example, when he tells Abraham, I shall make thy seed great. You understand? I shall make thy seed great. He told who? Abraham. Meaning that every believer, the Bible says, and we are the sons and daughters of Abraham by faith. Not out of natural loins, but because we believe. Therefore, it presupposes that naturally you and I carry a seed of greatness. But in Africa, who we are, what we are, is not defined. Praise the Lord. Some people now, up to now, still think, okay, that Africa is a poor continent. There is somebody right now on this ground thinking that to be a success, they'll have to get on a plane and go and live in the United States of America. You get my point? You go to the United States of America, and almost more than 60% of the population <laughs> is surviving under a few individuals. Americans are more poorer than you are. Some of you, you have a name on your car. These guys don't have a name on their cars. The plot of land you have is yours. They don't have plots of land. The house you have is yours. They don't have land. I mean houses. They are heavily indebted. The house is mortgaged. The car is under loan. You understand? Everything is because of credit. The moment credit is good, they will give you anything that you want. That's a false wealth. Why? Because you're passing credit and debt to your children. You get where I'm coming from. And some people, that's the place some people want to go. I've seen Ugandans in America, and I felt like whipping for them. They can't come back because they don't know where to come to, to start from. Let me tell you something and liberate your brains. You can be rich anywhere. I said you can be rich anywhere. You understand? The, probably the top 200 richest men in America almost own everything that you see. 51% of the Federal Reserves of the United States of America is owned by the Rothschild Foundation, one group of people. So who owns America? So there is a deception sometimes of what people define as rich, yet it is not what? Rich. And that pomp also has also created a certain falsehood or a certain false understanding of what wealth is. Eh? That's why you see there's a whole, whole line of bunch of wannabes. Today I was reading in the newspapers, there's like a group of young guys who are calling them the money, the money team. You understand? Africa. You see, what do you call the money team? You get it? 
if 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 you've forgotten the most ultimate principle, like Peter says, that every man ought to understand that the things we receive in this world are stewardship. It's stewardship. You understand? God has is entrusting and is giving all of us whether the money that you're gonna have in this world, all of that you should never leave. You understand it? Eh? Without the understanding that we are all just stewards of everything that the Lord pours upon us. Why? Because the primary responsibility of everything we are attracting is for our children and our children's children. Don't you see? That we're no longer working for ourselves anymore. But how many people are too selfish that I, mean, I don't give a damn. I don't even want to have kids. Me as long as I'm quiet. You understand? No Christian should have that kind of thought. Praise the Lord. Africa is rich, amazingly. They had us seeing a documentary, and one out of every every three Africans is in the middle class. The four fastest growing economies in the world are in Africa: Ethiopia, DR, Congo, Mozambique, and this other country. I don't know, Cote d'Ivoire. The fastest growing economies in, in the world are in Africa. You get where I'm coming from? I saw some guy was doing a research on how much money Africans sent back to Africa versus how much aid came into Africa. And Africans sent about $53 billion. And the aid, total aid that was sent into Africa was about 43. You get my point? Meaning that individual monies of people sending back to Africa is more Africans sending back to their homeland, they send more aid, more money than any, any funders, either World Bank or IMF. You realize that the total GDP of Africa, you understand, total GDP of Africa, the aid component only contributes 2%. Africa is not as poor as people think. But if you compare how much money comes in every year as aid versus how much money leaves Africa, you're going to realize that three quarters, are you hearing me? Of, of monies leave Africa because men have made money here. Are you hearing? And only one of that whole comes back to Africa. You know, it's almost three times more leaves Africa every year than, than the amount of money that comes in in foreign aid. Where do they get it? They get it in our lands. You get where I'm coming from? That I was driving through Luero and I was uh, with a certain broker. Uh, some guy wanted us to show me and pastor is a plot of land. And the guy started to show me lands that are brought by Indians. I started to weep. Eh? These guys have gone in Luweru, Kasana, where everybody listening to me. It doesn't matter what you do. Eh? You must understand that the greatest wealth in the world has an attachment to land. Whether it's gold or it's silver, whatever it is. Farming, anything, if you want to oil, you study. The richest people have an attachment to the earth. How many of you are, 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 are familiar with something they call rare earth minerals? Rare earth, you know that? When you, you remember that chemistry table, they were like the last one there. Eh? Yeah, they're like the, the wine pink. Eh? Rare earth minerals, eh? what has actually made China probably one of the greatest giants in business across the world is that they produce 90% of the rare earth minerals in the world. Predominantly, America used to be the leading producer. These guys infiltrated down our and started buying even their fields of rare earth. You get it? Rare earth, you get minerals such as the ones you will need to make magnets. When you probably look at a fighter jet, it needs about two tons of rare earth material. You understand? Where do you make magnet from? Where do you get it from? But I can shock you that if you came to Africa and started to look for rare earth, you can even laugh. We have too much. But we don't produce anything. China produces 90% of rare earth materials. It means that almost 90% of the world's electronics have to be manufactured in China for cheaper labor and access to these minerals, whether it's television or radio or your mobile phones, colored TV. If you don't have rare earth, you can't make a colored TV. You can't imagine it. You get my point. But all of these things we have in Africa, and even way more. So, Africa is not a rich, so it's not a poor nation. Oh, probably, continent. It's not a poor continent. We, it just has poor minds. Eh? So if by per adventure we take time to help certain people advance and probably know how these things work, we will have another mindset. If you have understood that every blessing 
you in fact some of you probably have different dreams but again in this life eh, you must do something that has to do with land and that is why i always recommend guys do agriculture just do it one time i was running a deal with a certain guy in the bank and i was running his accounts and then he got a deal with um, uh, some belgians came and in and they were looking for the most organic land they could access in africa and they were willing to give advances and loans of up to three percent annually meaning that if they invest probably a million dollars they only want three percent of that at the end of the year and they would invest it all and then give you money to plant whatever you have to plant and then buy everything you plant why because they are looking for the highest form of, of of organic avocado it's called demeter for some of you who have heard about it demeter is used in, in in pharmaceuticals across the world to make cosmetics it's used in um, in um, in, um, in in pharmacies for treatment and all, eh? in uh, pharmacies and 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 uh, uh, BT BT whatever these guys who make lotions, eh? those very expensive French lotions, eh? they use the highest form of, of avocado called Demita. And I can tell you on record that anybody who grows Demita avocado, that is the highest form of organic. The moment you pluck those trees in the ground like this, there is always a sponsor ready. I mean red. The moment you put the meter in the ground, they come looking for you. You understand me? But our guys are all putting what? <laughs> CV. You understand? CV. You get my point? What? CV. And in Africa, by the way, many of us realize where we come from. We have lands in the villages. You get where I'm coming from. We have what? Lands in the in the villages. Sometimes it all takes us back to there. If and as if we are, we must do it the God's way. You get my point. The ideas are there, but can we do it the God's way? You understand? You guys know that Israel probably is one of the greatest agricultural nations in the world. But if you look at the principles Israel uses, it's a hundred percent the mind of the Bible. They use biblical principles. For example, when the Bible says in Leviticus, that thou shalt not mingle your fields with various seeds. You get it? Many of those guys, you won't find them saying, now here I'll put pineapple, then down I'll put mango. No, 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 no. If the guy is going to grow one crop, he's going to grow one crop. There's another one who will say, ah, me, I want to grow multi because they think it's fair for you to grow this and then mix it with that and then. But are you richer than them? Are you doing better agriculture than them? Why are you doing it the smart way? Here there is a biblical way. The biblical way says don't mingle seed. If you're growing pepper, grow pepper. You see more blessing. If you're growing banana, you make up one thing to grow. Banana. Don't mix meat under banana. There are people who do that. It's smart, but it's not the godly way. One time I was reading a thing on a guy. You go on, the, on Google and read about this guy's story. I wish you get more information about the guy who wrote something. He has a website. It's called Farming God's Way. It's amazing. I mean, yeah, it's amazing. The way these guys do it, they only use biblical principles, but they are probably some of the richest farmers on planet earth you get where i'm coming from this is not an agriculture forum eh? i'm only trying to tell you like there is that <laughs> any other way whether it's mineral and that's why you realize that all of these things anything from the ground is spiritual never forget that anything from the ground is spiritual because it carries blessing and curse cursed is the ground blessed is the ground you get where i'm coming from that is why you hear many people die in uh, oil deals eh? they call it the curse eh? what do they call it the oil curse why because there's a spiritual perspective to it if your spirit is not established enough to sustain that glory you'll die in it you get where i'm coming from how many people have died because of gold how many people are dying because of silver how many people are dying because of red mercury how do you know how many guys eh, were involved do you know do you know for example, do you know that if red mercury is open just next to a guy, like you're about five feet, you stay there for long, you just collapse and die because of the strength of that thing. But there's a way they have to pack it and harness it to sell it a certain way. It's spiritual. You get You get But one kg of red mercury, <laughs> who has a clue about how many million dollars it is? <laughs> hundreds of millions of dollars <laughs> something this size in fact many people think it's a myth it doesn't exist you get where i'm coming from because that is that is that is 
that is that is that is national security you're owning something that can make nuclear you get my point you get where i'm coming from you're owning something that can what <laughs> make warhead you get it eh? even government would have interest in you they would look for you wherever you are you get it and you realize the guys who sell those things they never benefit from them at all somebody in the end the other side benefits from that stuff otherwise look at the biggest gold dealers in the world the people who have dealt in gold for like 30 years and they don't even have a house to their own name why because everything by the earth has the greatest blessing but has a very spiritual implication that means if you have to go into anything that has land in it you must carry a certain blessing i mean what wakes up a seed and it grows and tomorrow kills the whole seed One time I wanted to count a businessman, I know a friend of mine, he lost one million dollars in vanilla. One season. He planted vanilla worth one million dollars. He lost one million dollars. He was supposed to trip and probably quadruple that money in a space of a few months in vanilla. He lost one million dollars. You get where I'm coming from? Because he doesn't have the tenacity to what? To sustain it. So the reason why we probably put these things in you at the time we are taking to invest some of these things in you is per venture that your mind might be conditioned enough for you to be ready for what is about to happen. Why? Because again, I take you back. It is a principle of stewardship. The wealth that we are attracting individually is a stewardship that we carry and an accountability we owe to God to serve the ministry, the gospel that we believe and to invest for our sons and daughters. If you don't have that mindset, then you're in the wrong place. You get where I'm coming from. You must live on purpose. You must have a job by purpose. You must do business by purpose. You must make wealth by purpose. The world doesn't want to be proud of you because you're the richest businessman, no. The world wants to be proud of you because you're the richest businessman. And because you're the richest businessman, you have raised the church to a certain level. Not because you speak too much but because you carry certain responsibilities. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, there's this guy, um, he's very wealthy, very, very wealthy. For him, his brain is, for him, God created him to make money for the church. For him, that's what he thinks. Eh? You get it? But if you should probably talk with him and see the way he thinks, you realize that his is ministry. His is not survival. You know, many of us here, we are here just to get a job to survive. You understand? Chika. Eh? I've done business stuff as Carl. I had always discussing business. If you go there, you never know. You might learn something to improve my business. That's why you're poor. You understand? That's called poverty. <laughs> you get my point. Poverty is not when you don't have money. Poverty is when you think small about your mandate. Some of you, you think that your mandate on earth is survival. No. I beg to disagree with that. Your primary purpose on the earth is to serve God with everything the Lord has placed in your hands. Whether it's the word or money or whatever the Lord has placed in your heart, it has to be entirely of God. Hallelujah. Do we agree to that level? Do we agree to that level? So, anyway, um, that said, because you start to carry the mindset of, of, of doing things God's way, you start to adopt and revolve in the mind of divine purpose. Every child of God, if you are doing business and it has not been tagged to divine purpose and its story, then the primary thing you must do is tag it to purpose. If you don't tag it to purpose, then it's not vision. You get it? It's just a wish like little kids who say, I wish I was a, um, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish, like one time Pastor Isaiah's kid, <laughs> he ate chocolate cake and he told his father, I wish this whole house was a chocolate cake. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you eat chocolate and do what? Okay. <laughs> you eat chocolate and what? <laughs> you, you, for him, he just wants to wake up eh, when he's just nibbling everywhere. He's just cake. His mouth is full. He says, Daddy, I can't believe this. Oh, God. He said, he's all full like this. And he says, wow. You understand? He wants the whole house to become chocolate. Sadly, certain Christians think like that. If you don't have divine purpose attached 
to whatever you want to do in this world, then everything you're going to do is going to be frustrated because the scriptures are very clear. Frustration of potential is when a man has misguided purpose or no purpose at all in his aspirations. Never forget that. The moment your aspirations don't have divine purpose to them, your potential is going to be frustrated. Why? Because what is coming out of you is not going to be equal to what you're receiving out of the world because your potential is supposed to be a seed that is supposed to be planted in the ground earth and carrying a certain harvest, uh, treated, um, given all necessary nutrients as it ought to because the end line here is that at the end of the day, there must be a place where it has a certain glorification to the name of God, but as well has enough tenacity to sustain your children and your children's children. Hallelujah. Your children's children. For example, I do not understand how a Christian can expect to be wealthy when you don't do the principles that are laid down biblically for success. If you don't, you're going to go in the world and you're going to compete with everyone else. Whether you want it or not. You're going to go in the world and compete with everybody else. Because these are divine instructions. You get my point? The thing that separates us from the earth is the earth is going to always compete with each other. Men are going to kill each other for business. Men are never going to have enough. They're never going to have a satisfaction in their spirits. And there's always going to be danger and war and shedding of blood on both ends. What liberates you and I is the things that we do by purpose. You understand? By purpose, not just by wish. Or just the pushing for you to incline to it. You get my point? For example, fast fruit. You guys know, or you should know if you don't. Ezekiel 44, 30 is very clear. You take your fruit to your, to your priest. You understand? And of all kinds of oblation to your priest, the Bible says that he may cause a blessing to settle. He may cause. This. That means you, ha you must have a priest. <laughs> Every one of you, you must have a priest. That he may, and, and this is something I fail to understand. The other day, was seated, when we were banking, we were seated in a conversation regarding Islamic banking. And <laughs> one of the principles of Islamic banking to work, they always and must hire a Sharia professional. It's part of the offices in, in, in Islamic banking. That banking does not have interest rate to it. But it's probably one of the fastest growing banking firms across the world. And every Islamic bank has a sheikh, a spiritual authority. And those guys are literally paid $2,000 per hour of consultation. Their business is simple. Every business case has to be brought, if it is complicated and it's not in the jurisdiction of what is on the ground, it has to be brought before those guys to ascertain and relate it to the scriptures, the Holy Quran. To make sure that these two reconcile two thousand dollars every hour for consultation they carry offices in every islamic setting why you think down ends there are no professional lines you think they don't understand the whole lines of finance the back end back office operations front office the marketing teams the retail the whole plans and all these things they have all that kind of stuff but they know it is all nonsense if it doesn't have a certain opinion by god and that is why everyone has a priest. You get it? The Bible tells you, you shall take them your first fruit of all kinds of oblations to your priest. 4430 says that he may cause a blessing to settle. The word there for settling means that you don't need your business to stay. You just need a blessing to stay. Even if the business dies and the blessing is there, you can attract another business. But if the business is dead and you don't carry a certain blessing, whether you want it or not, you'll never attract. You get where I'm coming from? When your life is not sustained under the blessing principle, you struggle with many things in this world. Why? Because you don't have a higher power that is backing up your business or your wealth or your career. That's why certain people right now seated listening to me right now, they can be even fired tomorrow. You get where I'm coming from? You can lose that deal tomorrow morning. Somebody can come eh? and, 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 and get a hold of it. Are you hearing me? In the last moments of payments, and you're the one who has run the donkey work for five, ten months, and then somebody comes and just by a stroke of a pen takes it away. That evil is Ecclesiastes 6 talks about. That men have been given glory, wealth, and honor, 
but they receive not the power to walk therein. And a stranger comes, the Bible says, and devours it. He says that's an evil disease. And he says it's common among men. That should not be so for anybody on this ground in the name of Jesus Christ. The hands that began it shall see it to accomplishment. The Bible says that the hands that began building that temple, Zerubbabel, the Bible says the hands of Zerubbabel began it, and the hands of Zerubbabel shall finish it. The Bible, that God, the God is very clear. He doesn't despise humble beginnings. But I decree and declare upon your life by reason of the anointing that everything you started, whether it is a job, whether it's a deal, whether it's a certain, certain, a, certain, a certain contract, I pray in the name of Jesus that if it was your mind, your idea, and your story, in Jesus' mighty name, you will finish it. Say amen. Somebody say amen. You will finish it. Your hands will finish it. I decree and declare that people, strangers, will not come in in the middle and somehow interrupt you. You understand? I have seen people who started businesses. For, for rich people. And then tomorrow, the hard work, the guy sweats. And after finishing all that, they hire another guy and they say, you now, you can't handle. And the guy they hire is just there to swim on your blessing. You get my point. The customers, for example, if you're talking about a bank, a guy builds a bank from zero portfolio to billions of shillings. And then they fire him. Then it's a guy who doesn't want to work, just comes and sits in the office and maxes the whole day. And just these other billions come in because of one man's sweat. The Bible says that is an evil disease. It should never happen to you in the name of Jesus Christ. If you should leave that place, you should only leave it for promotion, not demotion or, or posting. Why? Because it's important for you to build legacy. It's very important. Everyone must be remembered by something. So you know the first fruit. Don't ever eat God's money. Don't ever eat God's money. Why? Because it doesn't matter how smart you want to be, you can't be smart on God. And you'll never have enough. There are dads dealing with a Christian who is not tithing. That's probably the second issue. Because they, um, they, well, they don't have enough, they overborrowed. So I asked her, how did you enter into the borrowing thing in the first place? She said, I was enticing. So if you're not tithing now, how do you expect to come out? Now, that kind of person has also come for counseling. But I pray for them that the Lord what? Helps them get out of debt. You get my point? And I told, told this dear woman aside, and I told her, the issue here is not getting out of debt. In fact, the issue should be, where did you fall to be in a place of believing God to bail you out of debt in a dispensation where you should have been lending to a nation? Don't you really think we are working backwards on this? How many Christians do you know lend to nations? But if Bill Gates wanted to lend Uganda, what would it take? He earns three times our GDP. Every year, one individual like this, he's breathing, has eyes. In fact, he puts on glasses. Many of you, you don't even put on glasses. Their shades just maridad. You get Do you understand what I'm telling you? Then, that's the second. The principle of giving to the poor. Never forget that. Never forget that. He says in Timothy, always remember the poor. That's why businesses do something they call corporate social responsibility. It has that kind of name, but it carries a spiritual implication. It's simple. Remembering the poor. That's why they reach out to orphanages, go in, in communities and, and give money to widows. But all of that is simple. Then you find a Christian who doesn't even do anything like that. He doesn't tithe, doesn't give to the poor, doesn't give fast food. And fast food is every year, by the way. Never forget that. For every 12 months you have every year, one month shouldn't be yours to eat. But that's hard, Monsumba. Okay, you stay in the world. Do you understand? It's an option. My business is very simple to set these facts before you. You choose to either do business the God's way or you, you live the worldly way. Are you hearing me? Why? Because the Bible is clear, and this is painful, that the love for money is the root of all evil. And the Bible says that many have pierced themselves with many a sorrow. Many a sorrow. But many people don't think about that. Do you know the Bible says that the ransom of a man's riches, are, the ransom of a man's life are his riches? This is Proverbs. He says that the ransom of a man's life are his riches. A guy refuses to do fast fruit, tights, and all these kinds of things. Are you hearing me? He gets a cancer. You understand? After he gets a cancer, he takes that money to GlaxoSmithKline to buy what? Medicine. And then you realize the amount of money he spends every month for medicine. It's not even a fraction of the tithe he should have given. How many people do you know 
have been tithing all their lives and have HIV, have cancer, have diabetes. Start this. You get people who have been tithing all their lives. If they have it, it's of no consequence. You watch many guys who say, more money, more problems. You get where I'm coming from. The Bible didn't say that they are pierced with many. The Bible says they have pierced themselves with many a sorrow. That guy's dealing with a guy who was spending four million shillings every month on drugs. He was a rich chap. What billions of shillings? The guy refused to tithe. He got a crazy disease eh? and he was spending four ma every month. By the time he got healed, eh, the business had died. And that's what the devil wanted him. You find a guy worth billions of shillings eh? now walking on the streets of Kampala. But there was a time he had. <laughs> there was a time he had. He just did not have the mind to do business God's way. Why? Because this money can become a lot. Do you know what it means to tithe 10 million? <laughs> you be tithing a caprimo every weekend, you understand, or every month. <laughs> Are you hearing me? So it's easy to say, God, yeah, I'll be faithful, but man, when you're signing that check, you'll be like, Maraca, stay bro. <laughs> you understand? It's easy when you're bringing 100, <laughs> because that 100 is 100. Either way, it can't give you trouble. You get it tight, that 100, and then you go in and you say, Why cho 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 karina. Then they bring those songs that, that, that have to touch you. <laughs> you know, Christians, you even have to touch them to give. They are not touched. Mm -mm. Do you have to touch them? <laughs> Can you give us a song while people are giving? That's that you tickle their, their emotional beat. Siganga and Sigo. Paradventure, the charisma might rhyme good, and the guy, Sigani, Sigo. And the guy, <laughs> Just can't tell guys, give. <laughs> you get where I'm coming from. So, even probably what some pastors now have resorted to, and those ones, also those ones, I have a problem with them. Eh? Ay, 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 ay. You get my point? Every worker is worthy of their meat. You get some pastors don't taste, but they also want to be. So I don't understand how they want it. You get my point? You want to reap what you don't sow. Then a guy realizes that stuff is tight. What does he do? He starts manipulating. One time a guy went for a certain lunch hour and he said, I need 50 people, each one with 100,000. That's five more. Mukama in a second of call a weekend. Weekend, in a weekend. weekend. In a week. And amazingly, guys who don't tithe fast fruit and all this, they fall for those things. Why? Because this is the devil himself robbing. Eh? A certain spell falls on them, and then you find a certain guy. Man, you get You see, pastors struggle with guys who don't give. Then one day, a guy goes to a wrong guy, and a guy gives everything in his life. Then you're even shocked. You get my point? Eh? Why? Because there, when it happens at that point, they are under the spell. They must lose. They are not obedient, no. They are bewitched, you get it. They are under a certain force. You get where I'm coming from. But now, when the Bible speaks of your life being ransomed for your wealth, never, ever, ever get to a point where you float the principles of God because they are your life. They are your life. Do you know that every man who gets to a certain level of wealth, eh? eh? Let me tell you something funny. Have you ever seen a street child... Um, abducted. They found a kid begging on the street. They took him and sacrificed him. Have you ever heard the devil is asking for street boys? Because there is a value somebody attains in this world and he becomes an interest to the devil. And that is why when you become rich, eh, the biggest attack on your life will be death. You get my point? <laughs> Not to become poor, but to die. You get? Because do you know what it means for somebody who is going to have the potential to build the kingdom and ascertain the wealth of his children and his children's children? Do you realize that you are affecting generations? And the only way to stop you, if he knows that he can't stop you a certain way, is to kill you. So that your wealth falls in the hands of the world or anybody else who can to get it. And that's the end of that man's story. You understand? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? That is why the richest people have the biggest level of security. 
they are not securing themselves from wild animals. No. They are securing themselves from individuals who are used by the devil in this world. You get my point? You tell five people that you're moving with 30 million in Yoka. That's your end. Satema. The guy looks at it as his life. You get my point? Yet there's another guy who doesn't even look at it as. No. Somebody can spend it on just one day. But there's another one who's ready to kill for it. Why? Because of the principle. You get where I'm coming from? So when you do that for the poor, praise the Lord. There's another thing I learned. It's in Corinthians. Eh? It speaks of the grace that we carry to have all sufficiency in everything we have and that we might be available for every good work. Now let me teach this to anybody who is going to make money or probably create wealth. Eh? Second Corinthians 9, what? 8. It says, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you that uh, you always, always, hallelujah, always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For example, as a pastor, as a man of God, the Lord told me, for example, if I have that faith that I carry all sufficiency as an individual, the Bible says then I must start to show forth a hand that scatters and not slacks and holds back. Because the Bible says is that which scatters and tendeth to increase, and there is that which holdeth back and tendeth to poverty. Many people, when they go to business forums, they are taught how to save. It is wise, but it is also ungodly. <laughs> not that saving is bad. No, 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 no. The Bible is very clear. Up, store up for the evil day. But only store up when you have done the primary things. Saving is not a bad thing. But saving is not primary. It should be last on your list after you've done everything. But today it's what's there. The other day I was listening to Christian teaching people how to be wealthy. And he was talking about saving. Save, save, save. Let me tell you, many of us don't save, but we are more blessed. <laughs> okay, I've not saved like certain people. Probably I could have a savings account, yes. But we've not probably spent more than we've saved. Eh? But I can tell you that we have way more financially, than many people will remember having savings accounts for 20 years ago. Do you understand? Some people, their business and mind is only one thing. Whatever you have, keep it. Whatever you have, keep it. You get one card order. You know people who will never, who, who will never even admit they are rich. The guy, he has 20 million. You go for barrio, he doesn't contribute in fuel, doesn't buy anything. I don't know. You understand? When they get to go out to spend, for example, when you guys are having dinner, he wants to be the last one. He wants to be waiting. Perhaps Brother Paulo might be touched on for adventure. <laughs> now Tarati says, hey, thank you. And man, that thing is in Americans. Eh? <laughs> Who has heard of a concept called going Dutch? You know what going Dutch is? <laughs> Let's go Dutch, let's go Dutch, let's go Dutch, let's go Dutch, man, let's go Dutch. And you don't know what going Dutch means. You go out to eat, eh? but everyone is counting the moment they finish eating. Eh? Everyone has to pay for their. Never do that. Never do that. Are you hearing me? That's a poverty mentality. About Uganda. When you go, prepare the bill. Fight for the bill. Because you must carry the faith that you have all sufficiency. And for every good work. Eating a meal with your friend was a good work. Fight for the bill. If you carry that mentality, you will realize that you'll never run out of food in your house. You look at parents who looked after other children. It's like, for example, when, when somebody doesn't have, if, you, if, a, if an old man doesn't have faith to be healed, for example, of, 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 of high blood pressure, some of them, you just advise them, adopt another person's kid. Because the scriptures are very clear <laughs> that they that look after the poor, the long shall prolong their life. That's why you realize people who look after other people's kids, they don't just die. But, but these guys only me and my family and my two daughters, those ones die. They die like chicken, you understand? But you realize that those people whose houses are always open for everyone to eat, they've never run out of food. Never, they never run out of food. There's always a certain way that opens another door for food. But you watch people who are always what? And my family shall, shall come, hide the food, hide the food, hide the food. Then they put it under your what? A bed, you understand? Hide, hide the food. They have come. You understand? 
you were eating and then somebody knocked on the door. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Then after that, the guy says, I'm rich in the name of Jesus. <laughs> oh, funny woman, funny. You get my point. You, you're rich. <laughs> huh? you, you are rich. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So, seek to scatter. It's more blessed, not blessed, blessed, not blessing, blessed. It's more blessed to give than to what? Than to receive. You can never outgive God. And that's one thing I learned. You can never outgive God. Now I tell you as a giver, and some of you know me, you can never outgive God. He will always outgive you. Why? Because you're not giving a poor God. Abu Uganda. You're not giving a what? A broke fellow. Now, when the Bible says that we know of the grace which can have us all sufficient in everything that we might have, be available for a good work, every good work. You get it? If you're a businessman, make sure you add value to another business. You can never burn out by lighting another candle. Yeah. You can't. You get where I'm coming from? Make sure you add value to every at least a business, every hour, every month. Some people make money and they say, you know what? I want to help you start another business as well on your own. Can I help you? You know what he's doing? He's saying, I have all sufficiency for myself that I have enough to share. Now, if this man was done, it gets into a place of need. God will always bail them out. Why? Because they are on the principle, I have enough for myself that I can share it. It's a faith issue before it starts to manifest in your life. You get my point? You get my point? When I was in university, my father used to give me very little money. I'll not even tell it to you because some of you will laugh. He always had faith, I think. No, I think he was always of the mindset that boys are not supposed to be given a lot of money. They have to learn to make money their own way. You get it? You know what I'm talking about, boys. Eh? Because even you, some of you share my story. Sadly, some of you even girls. <laughs> you get it? So my father used to give me very little money. So you know what I did? I got that scripture and I said I have all sufficiency for every good work. Every good work. And I said that because God I am so blessed, I'm going to educate a child on pocket money. Yet it was very little money. And then I went into the villages of Mokono and discovered that there were children who were, and who were going to school for 50,000 shillings. And then I would go to that family, preach to them the gospel, and I tell them, the Lord has told me to pay fees for your child. And then the mother cries, because to them it's a miracle. Fast forward years later, every time I pay millions of shillings, I've not stopped that. I take fees for kids, millions of shillings every time. And I make sure God's children's money is there beginning of time. I don't want a child to come back and say that they've sent me back on fees. If I think of anything, top of priority are those kids' fees. I have a list of them. Why am I doing it? I have all sufficiency for every good work. It's the same thing personally. Don't ever hold back with a thought that you don't have enough. The thought that you don't have enough and therefore you're holding back is going to hold you up forever. That is never going to produce results for your children and your children's children. You're going to produce poor kids. They're going to come in the world poor. Why? Because they are coming from your loins. You get where I'm coming from? Wealth is a family story. It's a legacy story. The people who are born, for example, in rich families, you realize there are people who will never need to do anything. But actually, the 1% richest people in the world, you realize that 90% of them did not make that money. It was inherited. And that 1% almost owns close to about 90% of the world's resources. It was inherited. Somebody else paid the price. You get where I'm coming from? So, when you do that, either to the poor, to carry the sufficiency, to build another person, that's why we add value to other businesses. When you're at your workplace, for example, and you're a banker, huh? or you're in the table, desk X, teach a new guy something to do. Just, I literally trained, I literally trained almost everybody in front of you. You get my point? Customer service, personal banking, business. I literally took time to train people, and I always wanted someone to come in. You get it? Some of you, you don't want to train because they'll take your position. That's so stupid. 
You get my point. That's a very poverty mindset. You get my point. But some, ah, he supposed to train the guy and he does it better. You understand? Let me tell you something. If you train a band and he does it better, you will automatically be promoted. Why? Because the scriptures have set the principle. The student will never be better than their master. They will never be better than their master. If they are promoted to your position, God will promote you to a higher position. Because the race is not to the sheep, neither the battle to the strong, neither bread to the men of skill. But there is that chance that happens to every man who understands how these principles are. If you are way up at your office, train somebody. Are you hearing me? Train somebody. Business continuity. In case I'm not around, I must have somebody at my desk who can do this. You understand? I remember I used to even write emails to certain people, recommending certain people for certain offices. Please push this guy. Give this guy an opportunity. Why should we go outsourcing? When there is somebody inside here, you understand? The reason why I'm trying to do it, I'm doing it for myself. You get what I'm trying to tell you? I must build somebody because when I am building, the principle is simple. You reap what you sow. If you help a man identify a business, God will cause a certain man to identify a business for you. But some of you, you're too, everything you're protecting, you're costing, you understand, it's mine, I can't allow anybody, this is my baby. Okay, is that which holds us back, the Bible says, and it tends to what? Poverty. You are attracting the spirit of poverty on your life. You watch the people who you worked with and were always selfish with information. They always failed and they were always fired. They always made a clumsy mistake and they lost their jobs, always. It's like kids who never used to like discussing with people. The guy can be too smart. Then on the last end exam, he nurses. And you're like, but this dude used to be too smart. What happened? Simple principle. He attracted the spirit. Hallelujah. So when the Bible tells you that you have all sufficiency for every good work, eh? you must always carry faith. And that's what makes you learn to scatter. Add value. If it's not money, recommend somebody. If somebody comes and says, I want to join hardware business. If it works for you, tell them, I, I advise you. This is why we buy the machines. You can set it up in a place like in Tinder. You understand? You understand? But some people say, huh, now if I bring this one. <laughs> yeah? if, 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 if I bring this one, yeah, this one will take, let me tell you. Christians don't deal with market share. Christians deal with blessing. We don't deal with market share. Are you hearing me? We don't deal with what? With market share. That is why you can be successful in a business that is failing another man. Because you're not a market share person. That this percentage of people pass this route. No. Let me tell you something. I worked in Chikubo. And I used to see men closing shops every day. Next to men who are increasing every day. And they are all doing the same business, receiving customers every day. But there is something that closes one man's business and sustains another man's business. It's called blessing. Never worry about market share. If the market is not in Uganda, God can bring a guy from Congo and he wants only your product. Are you hearing me? And he can buy everything in one day. Everything you, can, you think you carry. He can buy everything you, 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 you carry in one day. One time I invested, it was last year, I, I got quite a huge amount of money and then I, I, I talked to a certain guy. We, I, we got acres of land and then we planted... Um, certain things, eh? certain crops. There were melons, to be exact. And we got quite a huge area of stuff. And then I told this guy, you know what, let's just work. <laughs> the guy told me that almost everybody who had a farm during that time, their melons died. And they were just amazed that ours were growing. And the moment they grew, some guy came and bought them, all of them in one day. You get it? We didn't have to drive a 10 out to the market, please. Each one is 1,000. Yeah, no, no, no. Everything was cleared. The whole, everything was cleared in one day. And they realized, hey, you can actually grow something for four months, and then somebody buys it. And then another one drives the car every time to town. <laughs> then he packs. And then waits for somebody to buy piece by piece. Are you hearing me? I refuse that I should live that life. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I have seen people who had cattle. You know, guys... You get a guy's animals start to die while another man's animals are thriving. You remember the challenge that, that Laban found with Jacob? <laughs> Blessing is amazing. The Bible says that when Laban was giving Jacob animals, he gave him the fake ones. Eh? <laughs> Some weakling things he told him that you're supposed to have. And man, 
he gave a weakling animal to a blessed fellow. And the Bible tells us that the animals of Jacob became too fat that Laban's continents changed. <laughs> the guy could look at the guy's animals and he feels like, Now you know what is killing him. <laughs> I gave him weaklings. How come that? Blessing. Tell your neighbor, blessing. That's the principle by which we work. All of you are seated on the same desk, but you're not equal. You're probably doing the same jobs and you're under the same salary scale, but you're not equal. Somewhere, somehow, by reason of the blessing of God upon your life, a certain wind one time will blow from the south and take you north. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, the reason probably why, and now I want to conclude, the reason probably why I've taken us through this, have you benefited something? Have you learned? The reason why probably I've taken you through too much as this way is that we must carry the mind of divine purpose divine purpose, okay? Soon I'm going to preach to someone on that, but circumspectly to ministry, because I can share my own life from there. When I was working in Delight, I told guys by 1st November, because I knew God taught me the place of numbering my days, eh? and I have a sermon on that, I'm going to preach it soon. God taught me how to number my days. When you're doing business, for example, go just beyond the place of I have this plot, I must make this, but what is the purpose to it? Circumspect to the assignment that the Lord has placed upon your life. Some of you, for example, who are making money, you're just making it for the kingdom. But can you have a certain purpose perspective to it? Because when you have a purpose perspective, money will come. Money will come. Why? Because this is God trusting you, and this is you approving yourself a good steward. Heaven will do everything it can to partner with such men. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? So when purpose is established, you realize that the kingdom of God is going to be built by you. But secondly, you're going to leave enough for your children and your children's children. That's a good man. So we don't even tithe for ourselves anymore. We don't fast food for ourselves anymore. We don't give for ourselves anymore. You understand? When you do these principles, this is what happens. You, you, you trigger heaven to start bringing concepts, ideas, and the right networks. Never forget that. Concepts, ideas, or rather and the right networks. You get my point? You get an idea, the Lord reveals to you the methodology and brings the right person. When a man is doing that kind of thing, that is why we tell Christians, for example, if you start a business, dedicate it to the Lord. You get my point? When you start a job, dedicate that day to the Lord and say, God, this is to your testimony and glory. Because at the end of the day, you realize that if you are working in divine purpose, you meet the right people. The wicked and unreasonable are far away from you. Many of you realize that you went into wrong and shady deals and lost money because you dealt with the wrong people. When you're a purpose-driven person, God can't let certain people come. Or if they do, your spirit will always feel it. Why? Because you're moving under a certain action. Are you hearing me? You will realize that the things of this world are not about competition. When you're a child of God, you realize that all things work together. Do you understand the meaning of working together? For good, the Bible says, to them that love him, and the next line, and are called according to his purpose. Purpose is key. Now, a guy is out of purpose, but he wants all things to work together for good. If you're out of purpose, things will fall in shambles. Why? Because there is no purpose to it, even though you love the Lord. Are you hearing? To them that are called according to his purpose. So if I want everything to come together as it ought to, I must make sure that I'm in divine purpose. I'm aligned. Are you aligned? Are you aligned? You realize that divine instruction is like that. You get my point? I've, you know, I've been to places where I'm preaching and then I got a business deal out of that and I crack it and it works. But what took me there was just to preach. Kumbe God was wearing like a certain thing working together for, for my good. You get where I'm coming from, eh? Sometimes you enter a certain thing and then you meet a certain guy. You don't know why you met this guy. Then before you know it, you actually realize, actually, that guy knows a certain guy who can get you something. But at that particular point, you know there are people in this world who always meet the wrong people, apply for the wrong jobs, enter the wrong deals. You understand? Everything is wrong. Before you know it, you look at the guy and you realize he has a brain, but he has not made anything out of it. They can see that you've done too many things for so many years. But all of them, like the Bible says, they were vanity upon vanity. Why? Because they are not tagged to divine purpose. So even when you're praying, say, God, attack my career, my business, my vision to divine purpose. Because potential is going to be frustrated where there is no vision. The Bible says without a vision, people cast restraint. But there cannot be a vision if it's not 
stuck to divine purpose. Why am I doing? Why am I selling clothes? Am I selling clothes such that my household can eat food? That's, 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 that's immaturity. Are you building the kingdom of God and storing up for your children's children? If it is, then God, give me the roadmap. Give me milestones. Help me number my days to know exactly what I am. Then you realize that your life is going to be a kind of spirit-led life. Eh? And when it is spirit-led, you realize that it's just stewardship. It's not sacrifice. Stewardship. You get my point? Sometimes I give certain things and I even run mad myself and I say, eh, I give this. You get it? And then before you know it, a few days ago, God brings back something three times bigger. You get it? And then you're like, wow. But I didn't do it so I could get back the things three times bigger. I did it entirely because I am led of the Holy Spirit. You get where I'm coming from? There were times, for example, when I was growing up, and this I'm starting to tell people now, but I've not told it. I used to sign, get money, and here certain guys are holding conferences, and I get money off my account and empty it. Some of these men don't even know me. I never introduced myself. No. I gave a normal man and I told them, I hear Pastor so-and-so has a conference. Take this money for me. Don't tell them who it is. But why was I doing it? I was storing up. I was storing up. You get my point? Because the equal lines of this is two things. I must do something to continue this flowing for my children and my children's children. I also must do this for the purpose of God, because the Bible says in the issues of God that he must treasure, store up treasures where the moths and what cannot reach. And that is, I must build my children and my children's children, but I also must do things that can store up treasures, not riches, not wealth, treasures, okay, for me in the heavenly places. And those are things, like the Bible says in Luke, the place where you bless men who will never bless you. Never forget that. It's a parable. He says that when you go inviting don't invite the rich and the wealthy and the most successful, but invite the weak, the poor, the lame. Bless the men who will never bless you back. Some of you are like, Carl, I did this for this sister, and then she paid me back this. No, listen, the beginning of blessing for any man who must leave legacy is a man who does things for them that other people might never do for you. The other day somebody was asking this guy called Aga Khan. They asked him, how come you're giving too much money to the Africans? He said, it is because we feel it's a divine mandate that God separated the richest men and the poorest. And for such, this is Aga Khan saying, as a family, we know we were blessed to bless poor men. <laughs> this is a guy who is, not, who is a stranger to the covenant. But he has the mind that they are too rich and they were, they were anointed to bless poor people. So they invest hospitals and subsidize prices on many things in Africa, not just to have a name, but simply because they feel they need to give. That, you see, remember the principle, having all grace, that you have all sufficiency for all things, that you have more for every good work. So they feel for them, blessing the poor is a mandate because they are persuaded they are rich. You're dealing with people who the Bible has told that for this reason, our master, even though he was rich, made himself poor, that we, through his poverty, might become rich. And that guy cannot even think to bless poor people. But he wants to store up. You get my point? Some of you, your hand is too slack. You always count what you keep. No. Keep, learn to count what you give. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. There is that which scattereth, but increases. And there is that which holdeth back, but tendeth to what? Poverty. Hallelujah. The Bible says that the entrance of your word brings light. I actually had more to say, but I'm tired. <laughs> Can you raise your hands and speak to Jesus Christ? Speak in other tongues if you can. I've said too much. But it's up to you now to tell God for you what you've learned. You take your cabbit. If you've learned that agriculture is good, you pray about that. Come on, somebody, speak in other tongues. The Bible says that a good man stores up well for his children and his children's children. Father, I pray for every man on this ground in the name of Jesus Christ. If the Bible has say that you give us power to make wealth, that you might establish a covenant that you made with our forefathers, I pray for every man on this ground in the name of Jesus Christ, that the anointing of wealth will engulf them, not just riches, but wealth, that they will move in the glory of wealth, that they will move in the transition of the ministry to the glorification of the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I thank you, God. 
because there is nothing they are doing in the kingdom that shall not bring glory to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you. Father, I thank you. Because somebody's business is improving. Somebody's job is improving. I see somebody being quickened in career in the name of Jesus Christ. You're going to go faster than your peers. You're going to be more quickened than anybody else. I know that you're working with people in the name of Jesus Christ. But God is going to draw a difference between you and everybody you work with. You will be quickened before anyone. You will be established before anyone. You will get things that the people you work with don't get. You will establish things that people who earn your salary do not establish. And people will know that the race is not to the strip, neither the battle to strong, neither, neither bread to the men which are wise, in the name of Jesus Christ. But all of these things happen to every child of God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and believe. Give the Lord a mighty hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. These things work. Tell your neighbor these things work. When I was praying, I just remembered, you know these guys, these university guys who made a mobile app for Fanel? They came and said, we want to give first fruit to God, you know? And our first fruit is the first app we are inventing. We want to give it, we want to give this app to God, you know? And the other day, they sent me a message and said that there's a guy who, who knew them from Fanel. And the Lord told him to pay for them office space, eh? <laughs> They're in office space. You understand it? The secretary, coffee, what? You get where I'm coming from. And it's amazing that these, these boys are just from campus. You get where I'm coming from. And there's somebody right now struggling with rent <laughs> in the office. You get where I'm coming from. So when I hear those things, I'm encouraged to know, hey, by the way, this thing we believe is what? It's working. Gamba Chikola. Hallelujah. Now, the words I've shared, they seem simple, but they are very serious. Some of you, your lives eh, are not going to remain the same again. Your children are going to eat on your sweat. Your children's children are going to eat on your sweat. That means when your sons are also coming, they will now, your children will start from great-grandchildren. They won't start from their children because their children are going to be catered for. Say amen. That means your sons and daughters, for them now they are going to start on their grandchildren and great-grandchildren. They're not going to look for fees for their children, no. They're going to enter business and work and career just for their children's children. They're going to do businesses out of passion and purpose, not out of the money, because the hugest bondage for any Christian is to chase money. You're in it for money. You're right, you're here and you're doing a job for money. Go back to God and talk to him, because you're not supposed to be living that life. You're supposed to be living a life of purpose, not money. The money comes where purpose is. Hallelujah. Visions carry provisions. God's will is his bill. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.